Hello space fans and welcome to the first edition of Deep Astronomy Bookshelf. Today we're going to be talking about the brand new book by Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw, Universal, A Guide to the Cosmos. <laughs> Now, I have said many times on this channel, in hangouts and videos and articles on my website, that we live in the golden age of astronomy. We live in a time when discoveries about our cosmos and the knowledge of the universe and our place in it are coming at us at a pace that is unprecedented in human history. And we also live at a time, for better or worse, where we are also in the golden age of science communication. And I say it that way because I kind of have mixed feelings about the direction science communication is going in the modern era, in this golden age. And, and the reason I think that is that I think an awful lot of modern science communicators are pushing a little too hard on this idea of scientism. Now, scientism is, has been around for a very, very long time. It's nothing new. But I'll just to get you up on the conversation and where I'm going with this, I'll, tell you, I'll give you a couple of definitions. This is from a philosopher, Tom Sorrell. This is an older definition. Scientism is a matter of putting too high a value on natural science in comparison of other branches of learning and culture. And another definition, this is from MIT physicist Ian Hutchinson. Uh, he says that science, that he says that scientism is science modeled on the natural sciences is the only source of real knowledge. Now, in the modern day, some modern day examples uh, of scientism would include Carl Sagan, for example, said this, the cosmos is all that ever is or was or ever shall be. And another example comes from Steven Weinberg, who wrote the book, The First Three Minutes. And this is another book we will revisit in this video series. But he says that the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. And finally, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking has said, in my opinion, there is no aspect of reality beyond the reach of the mind. So these are examples of scientism. And while I am certainly, in, uh, while I'm certainly uh, appreciative of this viewpoint, in fact, I'm sympathetic to it, I, I'm starting to wonder if it's not doing more harm than good when getting when getting ideas out in the golden age of astronomy to people who might not otherwise hear these discoveries and concepts. And so it's because of that, and I bring that up because it is exactly the way that the authors of this book handled that, I think was exactly right. This is an amazing book. It's a, it's a guide to the cosmos. It's very ambitious. It tries to do quite a few things, but it is, in my opinion, does a, does a delicate, it, it, it successfully balances this idea of science as a discovery mechanism and the wonder of the uh, cosmos without coming across as condescending or uh, alienating. And so I really liked the way this book presented itself. So the first chapter in the book is called The Story of the Universe, and it tells a very nice, in a very flowing and an easy way to read, the story of what what we know about the universe up to this point, and it sort of a, is an outline for the rest of the book. And I really found it a really enjoyable part of the, of the book itself. So I think the biggest, best thing I can say about this book is that all of the newer concepts that have come about as a result of the last 25 or 50 years of discovery in this golden age of astronomy, new concepts like uh, exoplanets, um, dark energy, dark matter, uh, gravitational waves, all of it is explained at some point or another in the book in a way that I felt was very uh, accessible and easy to understand. And the distance to the stars chapter does a really nice, uh, gives really good definitions of things like redshift, explains what Cepheid variables are, as well as type 1a supernovae, and it also tells the story of how Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe in a, in a very good way. I thought they did a great job with this. So this book answers almost all of the questions that you might have about what we know about the universe today, the modern view of the cosmos. And in the, and in the chapter on Einstein's theory of relativity and the shape of the universe, there's probably no more concise explanation for the shape of the universe, like why we think it's flat versus what will be the consequences of a curved universe and or a saddle universe. And so this, 
this, the explanation there is also extremely well done. But to give an example of what I mean about how well this book balances the ideas of scientific discovery and the wonders of science without coming across as, as condescending and alienating like I believe scientism advocates in many in many ways. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. And so this excerpt is, a, is a, on the chapter of the Big Bang talking about redshifts. And um, let me just read it to you and you can see what I'm talking about. We'll use the NASA Extragalactic Database, which is freely available on the web, and explores how redshifts of a sample of galaxies vary with their distances from Earth. So far in this book, we've tried to make our own measurements. So looking in a database might sound like cheating, but it's only a little cheat. And this is the part I like. It is possible for an amateur astronomer with a reasonably sized telescope costing a few thousand pounds, a spectrograph, a digital Im imaging system, and a laptop to make galaxy redshift measurements for galaxies out as far as 10 megaparsecs. And that's true. That's another great thing about the golden age of astronomy is that technology is also allowing amateurs to do this kind of science. Imagine getting a redshift of a galaxy 10 million parsecs away. Now, the abs the abs <laughs> in getting back to my comment about scientism, the absurdly suspicious or commendably enthusiastic reader who doesn't trust the databases is encouraged to take this route. Indeed, if for some reason you don't believe the redshift data, then you should take this route because it will inform you that your opinion is wrong and the databases are right. Taking delight in being shown to be wrong is one of the most important skills any human being let alone a scientist, should develop. Let me read that again. Taking delight in being shown to be wrong is one of the most important skills any human being, let alone a scientist, should develop. And this is what I'm talking about. You would never hear a person preaching scientism say something like that. This is accessible. It's saying if you don't agree with the databases, then you can, in this day and age, with moderately priced equipment, make the data observations yourself. See the red ships for yourself. And this is the tone of the entire book. And so I feel like this is doing what a lot of science communication books do not do. It's saying that science is important, but don't just believe it out of hand. Try it for yourself. And even when it comes to cases like redshifts of galaxies 10 mil or millions of parsecs away, you can find out for yourself. Now, I don't hold any illusions that the casual reader is going to go out and actually make these measurements. But what, it, what the, this book is doing by saying things like this is it is offering to the reader a chance to question these things themselves and to under and to not be talked down to okay science is a humbling endeavor and i think this book uh, explains that quite nicely so in the chapter on the big bang i think that the explanations of things like inflation theory which a lot of people have which is quite controversial in this day and age they make a good case for how it is the way it is. I think that was done very well. In the chapter, What Happened Before the Big Bang, uh, you, things start getting really intense and you need to pay very close attention to some of the concepts, things like the horizon problem uh, and the shape of the universe problem. All of this stuff is covered and talked about quite nicely, but I, I really think it's done in an accessible way uh, for just about anybody who doesn't have a background to understand. And that chapter on What Happened Before the Big Bang, when it talks a lot, when it goes into the issue of the cosmic microwave background, it, this book has the best explanation of baryon acoustic oscillations I have yet come across. I think I actually finally understand it myself. This is a concept I have always struggled with, even with my days at the Dark Energy Survey. So this was great, and I was really happy to finally understand that concept. And finally, I'm going to leave you with my favorite chapter, which is the last one, Our Place. And I don't know, that the the it, it the the it, just like the first chapter which tells the story of the universe and lays out what the what the book is going to be about this one is my favorite because anybody who follows me at all knows that one of the reasons I start the deep astronomy channel is I want to provide perspective on our place in the universe. And I've never read anything quite as good as that chapter in doing that. Brian Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw do a great job of synthesizing all the concepts that have come across and, and, and ask, where do they lead us? What, where does the inflation theory take us? Uh, he goes into string theory, uh, multiverses, and even the fact that why, why the inflation theory might even lead us to the fact that we may be living in a, sim, in a simulation. But he's even able, without coming off as argumentative or 
condescending, he's able to use the multiverse idea as a way that obviates the need of a creator. Because if we are, if infinite universes are possible, then all of them are possible, and every single possibility that we could ever think of exists in some way, and so a universe with human beings in it is inevitable. And so it argues against the need of a creator in that way, which I found very thought-provoking. I, th I like the way it was presented, uh, the, and it's true. If and if we go where inflation theory leads us, and we subscribe to string theory, and we follow that there are uh, basically an infinite number of universes that may be possible, then yes. Th so yes, not only is a creator not necessary, uh, but our existence is actually a foregone conclusion. Of course we would be here, because all things exist somewhere. A very <laughs> mind-bending thing. And finally, he does go in a little bit to the idea of a simulation. Uh, that this week, if we had the proper understanding of th string theory and were able to have the computing power necessary to simulate string theory, then we could create simulations that, and just with just randomly at random and see where it leads us. And if that's the way the, the universe really is, then we should one day be able to try it out for ourselves. We can't do that right now. So anyway, um, I thought that was very good. So in conclusion, as I said at the top of the video, we live, for better or worse, in the golden age of science communication. We have a lot of the, the big guns that today are Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, uh, Bill Nye, and we have science communicators like uh, Phil Plate and uh, YouTube stars like Thunderfoot, all of whom... <sighs> I think are on the verge of doing a lot of harm when it comes to trying to preach outside of the science bubble. And, but Brian Cox, another really big name in science communication for the BBC, has, has managed to sidestep all of those issues that I find so troubling and does an outstanding job with this book of presenting his view and of, of not only how science works and how good it can be, but also in a way that might reach people who are not predisposed to learning about science. And to me, that is the single most important thing a science communicator can do in this modern age. We have plenty of people who, who we can talk to that love science, love astronomy, and are very critical thinkers. What we, what we need to do as science communicators is reach those who are not already in our choir. And I think this book is a great way to bridge that gap. Okay, well, space fans, I hope you like this video. I, if, if you want to see more of these, the best way to let me know is to watch it. Thumbs, thumbs up, thumbs down it, uh, like it, dislike it, share it, uh, and make some comments. So tell me what you'd like to see. I have a whole bookcase of stuff here to go through, and I'd love the chance to talk to you about some of the things in this book. So please let me know what you think, and I want to thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up.